Welcome to the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. If you're looking to create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want, you're in the right place. Our goal is to simplify and make real estate investing easy for you. For more information, you can find us at www.jlm.realestate. Everyone, welcome back to the podcast. This is your host, Jason Lee. Today, I have my friend, Mike Beckham, the CEO of Simple Modern. Mike, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I really appreciate you responding to my uh, Twitter DM and, you know, willing to hop on the show. I know how busy you are. So, um, you know, I'm just really happy to have, you know, 20 to 30 minutes to kind of get to know you and your story. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, Jason, I, I really view one of the things that I want to be investing time in is not just talking about the simple modern story, but I'm also really passionate about entrepreneurship in general. I teach uh, at the University of Oklahoma, and I love opportunities to be able to, you know, talk about some of the things that I've been fortunate enough to learn uh, over the last like 12 or 13 years of of doing the entrepreneurship thing. Yeah, I mean, um, you have so much experience in the e-commerce space and entrepreneurship in general. So um, kind of the, the first question I wanted to ask you is how did you get into it? And um, yeah, what's your story, your background? <laughs> Yeah, super atypical story. I don't know if any entrepreneur has a, a typical arc, but um, mine's probably particularly uh, abnormal. I graduated, I was a finance major, and I graduated from college thinking I'd either go into the business world or maybe get a PhD in finance and teach. But my wife had another year left on uh, a master's of, in accounting. And so I got this opportunity to, to basically work in a nonprofit ministry for one year while my wife finished her, her college uh, education. Uh, and so did that, raised my support or his salary. Basically, it was like $18,000 a year, struggled to raise it. Um, so I was not making the big bucks uh, my first year out of college. But I loved working in the nonprofit world. It actually uh, just... I love the way it impacted me as a person. I love that I felt like I was making a difference in other people's lives and ended up, you know, one year turned into two, turned into 10 kind of thing. And so by the time I got to 30, I'd, I'd been in the nonprofit world, you know, my entire working career. And uh, I, I felt pretty comfortable in my own skin, but it was also like, well, I guess, you know, I guess I'm not going to really use the finance degree. I guess I'm not going to I'm certainly not going to teach, you know, I'm not going to, uh, there's nobody in the business world that's kind of like banging down my door, uh, trying to hire me. Um, I have a younger brother who was about two and a half years younger than me. He'd started like a online marketing company, uh, just like a one person company and had done pretty well, but he really wanted to start a more substantial company. And we had this idea. It was like an online auction, uh, website, uh, that had launched in Europe, but wasn't in the United States. Uh, and we thought the the concept was interesting. And so uh, he asked me if I would, you know, just as like a side project, would I help him start something? And I thought, sure, you know, like this would be a great hobby. Um, we recruited a few other guys. One of them was my best friend from high school. And uh, in October 2009, we started that company. Uh, and it took a few months for us to really understand what we were doing. And then all of a sudden the thing just took off. So about a year in, we had our first million dollar revenue day. Um, and, you know, honestly, we were, we were too like new to entrepreneurship and too young to really even understand how ridiculous something like that is. Um, and I was working like these really crazy weeks at this point, I was working like this full-time job in kind of the nonprofit ministry world. And it was growing really ra rapidly. And then I was basically like leading um, all, all the economics for this uh, for this startup that was growing like crazy. Uh, and then we got pregnant with our, our first kid. And it was like, OK, there's no way I can do all these things at the level that I want to do them at. Um, and so I went full time into the business world, uh, ended up with my brother. We started uh, two or three more businesses. Uh, a couple of them were like, you know, just total failures where we lit a bunch of money on fire couple of them were nominally successful. But by the time I got to about 2015, uh, we had done almost a billion dollars in e-commerce sales. And this is kind of before Shopify and the democratization of e-commerce. It was really Amazon and, and, and just a few other players. So there weren't many people that knew as much about e-commerce as we did. Um, you know, we're in the middle of Oklahoma. It's kind of random. 
but we just, we had, we'd done a lot of, a lot of business and we'd learned a lot of things. Um, a couple of guys that had worked under me that I'd known for years uh, approached me and said, Hey, would you be willing to do just kind of like a side business side project with us? And I, you know, I've always kind of dreamed about being a CEO and starting my own organization, owning uh, the culture of an organization. Um, and so I don't think I had this in mind when we started it, but I thought, hey, it'd be, it'd be a really fun side project. Um, and that was basically the birth of Simple Modern. Um, so that was 2015. We sold our first water bottle in uh, March of 2016 uh, and totally bootstrapped company, didn't take outside money um, and have basically grown like our hair was on fire pretty much ever since. Um, at this point, uh, this year, I think we'll probably sell about 11 million units. Next year, we think it could be 20 million units. So we're we're a nine-figure revenue company that might double year over year. Um, the we're the biggest uh, you know unit supplier to Amazon to Target. Uh, we just went nationwide in Walmart. Um, we're licensed with we we have a really great licensing business. Licensed with the NFL, the NCAA, um, Disney, and and really a host of other. Uh, great intellectual property names. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of uh, where we are today. Um, so more or less, I've spent the last 13 years or so really heavily involved in e-commerce in one way or another. Now with Simple Modern, we have kind of like a larger footprint and we're really involved in physical retail. Um, but I, I definitely cut my teeth in e-commerce and uh, have been fortunate enough to uh, to be in some situations where um, you know, things just, just went well. Uh, and as a result, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made about every mistake you can make. And I've learned a lot of stuff along the way. And, and most of my teaching and, you know, things I share on social media, stuff like that is really born out of the experience I've had in the process. It's amazing, Mike. Um, your story is extremely inspiring. Um, you know, the, the thing that caught my eye about you is, um, you know, you, you said in a, in a tweet that in 2016, when you started Simple Modern, you were, you know, competing against big giants like Yeti and Hydro Flask, mm -hmm. but you found mm -hmm. a niche where you could kind of jump in and kind of hit a target market. Um, how did you do that? Like, how, what was your mindset behind st starting Simple Modern and attacking this specific industry? Right. Well, you know, I, I think that there's there's a few kind of building block principles that are really helpful for people to hear. And one of them is that... Uh, the world just needs more competent people executing on things. There's always a deficit of really competent, motivated people. And uh, it's easy to forget that. But that's part of the reason why in just about every industry, there's always room for another really well-run company. No matter how many competitors there are, there's always room for another because the world is is just at a deficit. You know, when you're, when we first started Simple Modern, I remember how it, it really felt like, gosh, I am just working so hard to get anybody to take this seriously and to try and get people to, to want our product. Um, and then there's kind of this tipping point where you realize, man, you know, the system needs us as much as we need the system, you know, that it needs competent suppliers. And this was especially evident over the last two or three years when kind of the, the supply chain was on fire and, you know, COVID and everything else is that the world really needed competent companies that were well run to deal with the, you know, the, the carnage. So that's one kind of principle is that, and it's the reason why there, there tends to be this overestimation of ideas, you know, in entrepreneurship and an underemphasis on execution, but everybody who's actually been an entrepreneur will tell you like execution is really the secret sauce that, um, lots of people have ideas. I mean, like, I don't even, you know, the idea of starting a water bottle company, when I tell people our numbers and I, I tell them about it, they're always shocked because it seems impossible. It seems impossible that, you know, in 2016, you could have started a company in an, such an obvious industry and get this big. What people don't think about is like drinkware is an enormous industry. Like it's probably, you know, tens of billions of dollars just in the United States. And so there's always going to be opportunity. So there's this other principle, and I kind of touch on this in, in the thread that you referenced on Twitter, which is uh, every strong competitor is strong because they have a distinctive strategy. They don't try to do everything and they do their thing really well. 
So in this instance, I'll use Yeti. Yeti is a, a really well-run uh, brand from my estimation. They, they've done a good job with their brand. They've, they've created a lot of value. Um, we, If we were going to get into drinkware, we were never going to beat Yeti at Yeti's game, right? It, it was not going to be possible. Their um, presence with certain demographics, especially men in certain ages, you know, people that are really outdoor oriented, um, from our perspective, was nearly impenetrable. Um, and their stronghold in certain types of distribution uh, was going to be almost impossible um, to overcome. But the fact that Yeti is so strong in some ways, by definition, means they're not going to do other things. That their focus and their hyper competence in some areas means like you're never going to see Yeti on a Walmart shelf. Right. So that's a ton of distribution that they're just not even going to compete for because they're running a different race and trying to do a different thing. And what you can do is you can, by really studying an industry and learning about the strategies of all the, the, the really competent firms, you can start to see where are the areas for another really well-run company, because there's always there is always this white space that is white because it falls outside of kind of the, the strategic focus or sphere of confidence, competence of the, the really strong companies. So what we did with Simple Modern is we just said, okay, there's a lot of great companies in this space and we're not going to win doing the exact same thing that they're doing. But there are areas where they're not focusing um, and where they haven't built their strategy around because the things that have made them successful or something else uh, so for us, the biggest two things at the time were we we realized that drinkware was going through this transition of becoming almost like a fashion item, that it has a functional, like a watch or like shoes or a purse, it has a functional element, but it also has this stylistic element. Um, so even though this is, it, it, in some ways, it's hard to believe, in 2016, Yeti was still selling um, just stainless steel. They didn't sell anything with powder coating or colors. Um, and so we were one of the, the earlier companies to really focus on how do you differentiate this? How do you bring in the style component? Um, and then the other thing we did is we really looked at the channels and realized that Amazon was probably the most relative to its size. Amazon was an underutilized channel. And then we kind of mapped that, well, like, what are we good at? And, you know, our founding team, we were really... Uh, we were really experienced with e-commerce. We were really experienced with algorithm writing. We were experienced with sourcing. Um, and we used some of these qualities. We, we saw that like, okay, Amazon's being under-prioritized by other people. We have the skill set to do really well there. And uh, we, we can bring in these kind of distinctive looks. And that's how we got our initial product market fit. The other thing that came from that, and we were probably not as deliberate here, but it makes sense, as we leaned into a lot of different colors and we leaned into that channel, we started to really establish a voice with a particular demographic, you know, women 20 to 50, you know, that, that lived in more, you know, in areas where there was higher e-commerce penetration, higher Amazon usage. This started to be our, our core demographic. And what that's led to over the course of the company is that you start to see other things that your customers want to buy from you as you establish a voice. So for us, the, probably the best example is we only did adult drinkware for quite a while. And then something like 2018, we launched our first kids drinkware and kids drinkware has been just amazing for us. But the reason why it's amazing for us is because we found the white space, we established, you know, a voice with females 20 to 50. And then when we had that voice, we released kids drinkware. So, you know, releasing kids drinkware in 2016 probably would have been crazy. Um, we probably wouldn't have had much of a chance, but because we found a white space somewhere else that opened up to us later. It's amazing. Um, so how did you, so tell us more about the story of how you scaled it to such a big business. How did you um, take it from, you know, selling a couple bottles and to, yeah. you know, selling millions of units now? Well, you know, Functionally, what it is, is you buy inventory, you get it in, you, you sell it at a profit, and then you put it all back in and more inventory, and you just rinse and repeat. Uh, I've told people that my experience running the company for the first two or three years was I would, <laughs> I, I would buy a bunch of inventory and think, wow, I bought way too much. I'm super nervous about how much inventory I bought. 
then the inventory would get in and it would start to sell. And it was like, oh my gosh, I didn't buy enough inventory. So, okay, I need to make another order. Okay, I'm going to go really big. <clears throat> I'd go as big as I felt comfortable with. And then at the last second, I'd add 20 or 30%. That night, you know, I wake up with a nightmare because I'm, I'm like, I bankrupted myself. I bought too much. The inventory gets in. We didn't buy enough. It was just like that cycle, like over and over and over again. And it's definitely the challenge of bootstrapping is that, um, you know, we had to kind of, we had to create the capital for growth. And at times that is more stressful. I probably, you know, one of the things I tell people is now that we have gotten to scale as a bootstrap company and we don't have outside investors, it's probably the single best experience you can have as an entrepreneur is having a business that's very profitable, that's scaled, where you, you know, it's owned by the people operating it. Uh, and not by outside investors, but I definitely have more gray hairs as a result. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I talk about this a lot in in kind of entrepreneurship classes, but there's several different ways <clears throat> that you can fund a business and all of them have trade-offs, right? Um, you know, like taking venture capital uh, or, or private equity capital to grow your business, um, you can grow a lot faster. And Sometimes you can do it with less stress, but you have different, you know, you have different things that you give up. You're now saying, hey, I'm really committed to selling the business in five years or in seven years, whether I want to or not. And I'm going to have the pressure to hit certain growth numbers. But one of the ways that plays out for us is that we're constantly talking to these massive retail partners that we're fortunate to have. But I'm also able to walk into any negotiation and say, hey, we are, we are happy to partner with you if this makes sense. But we're not going to say yes to something just because, you know, you're offering us more volume. If it's not a good deal, we can walk away from it because we don't have to have those sales. We don't have to have that money. And that's actually kind of a superpower because almost everybody else involved with the process on the retailer side or the other suppliers kind of does have to have that volume uh, in order to, to hit their numbers or get their bonus or whatever else. So did you raise any money for your business? Nope, no, no money raised. I had a couple hundred thousand dollars saved from success that we had had in uh, the very first business we started and, you know, put that in as the seed capital. And then uh, we've basically grown off of that. That is amazing. I did not know that. Yeah, it's it's one of the things I've come to appreciate that, like, it, it's it's funny, like entrepreneurship takes a certain level of naivete, you know, like where you, if you, if you really understood, it's like, don't tell me the odds. If I knew the odds, I wouldn't do it. And I think in retrospect, if I understood that statistically, it's almost impossible to do what we've done. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't have done it, but I, I didn't realize how, how crazy the idea was. Um, and so yeah, we took, we took a couple hundred thousand dollars and have thrown it into the, the company that we have today. Wow. So Pre simple modern, um, you had experience, you know, you had over a billion dollars in sales on e-commerce. What exactly right. were you, um, what were those experiences like that you had before simple modern? Well, you know, we were running an online auction website and I think for me, the biggest thing that I gained from that period is I became very, I developed a lot of blocking and tackling skills. Like you, you really, to be a great entrepreneur, you do need to be able to execute. And you, you know, some of it, at some point it becomes about leading and about strategy, but it's also about you just, do you have the skills it takes to kind of make things happen? Because especially early on, you know, in a company, like you wear like 10 different hats and you have to be the one executing. So uh, that was one of the biggest things I took away from the two big things I think I took away from the very first venture we did. The first was um, <clears throat> I learned some of the things that happen, some of the waves that you ride as an entrepreneur, like where you feel like things are going great or you feel like things are going terrible and like they're 12 hours apart, you know, like and how you can kind of, and that a lot of being effective and successful is about being able to manage yourself and your emotions, not getting too high, not getting too low, um, and I, I've probably been able to do a better job of leading the team with Simple Modern just because I knew a little bit more about what to expect um, because I'd been through it before. Um, the, the probably the, the other thing, like I said, that I've learned is I just I developed a lot of practical skills 
And this is one of the things about e-commerce that's kind of unique and interesting. To be good at e-commerce, you, you, you end up having to be good at like 50 different things. You gotta be, you gotta understand, you know, split testing and legal, and you have to understand sourcing and fulfillment and you know, CRO, and, and you have to understand uh, digital marketing and, you know, and it's like, you have to understand hiring and you have to, you know, can you just make the list? And it's like, oh man, there's like 20 different things here that I need to have some competence in. And so I, I tell people all the time that, you know, Quibbids, which was our first company, it was a little bit to me, like uh, getting an MBA on crack, you know, where I just, I learned about a bunch of different things and it was kind of all smashed together. Um, and it gave me a great foundation to, you know, to build off of for the rest of my career. Amazing. Um, earlier in the show, you talked about how you made a lot of mistakes along the way. Can you tell us a story where you made a mistake and kind of learned a, a real, a real good lesson from that mistake? So, uh, yeah, I'll give you a specific example, but I'll, I'll also make a, a general ob observation, which is I, I make mistakes every day. You know, like I think fundamentally. Um, so I'll, I'll go a little bit philosophical for a second, and then I'll, I'll bring it into practical. Um, the self view that you have of your, the self view that you have really matters and it really impacts the way that you experience the world and the way that you grow. And, uh, when I was in college, about halfway through college, um, I had this kind of, uh, you know, spiritual turning point in my life, but a fundamental component of that was this belief that, you know what? I'm, I'm deeply flawed and I'm going to often get things wrong. And, you know, you, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but you don't have to be a Christian to kind of accept that view that like, you know, we all get to see our day to day and our thoughts and stuff. And we realize like, we just, we have flaws. We, we are imperfect people and we make mistakes a lot. And, um, we, we don't like that about ourselves. And sometimes we like to try and create a narrative, uh, in our own mind, uh, that we're not as flawed as we really are. But the moment that you start to kind of accept that, like, I'm going to make plenty of mistakes and I'm, you know, I'm going to need forgiveness. I'm going to need grace for myself. And I'm going to need grace from other people. Then all of a sudden, um, it really creates possibility for more growth. And the reason is because you, you stop fighting that and you start, and you start welcoming feedback and you start, saying, hey, it's actually okay and normative for me to fail. And so, you know, like we talk about pivoting when we talk about entrepreneurship, usually the way that people think about pivoting is like, I was going this direction and then I realized this is failing and I'm gonna go this totally different direction and try this different thing. I'm gonna pivot, you know, 45 degrees. And um, most of entrepreneurship is actually one degree pivots. It's where you realize like, not like, oh, I made this massive mistake and I, you know, I've, I've been thinking about it this way and it's the complete opposite, but it's more like, oh, I, you know what, I've been approaching it from, you know, this particular point of view and I'm close, but that's not quite right. It's actually the customer, what the customer really wants isn't this, it's, it's this other thing that's kind of close, pretty close, but it's a little bit different. And so early on in a business, you're making kind of bigger uh, pivots, bigger angle changes, but I, I probably pivot every single day. Um, and it's based on the idea that I'm, I'm constantly learning. There's constantly ways I can get better. There's constantly mistakes, uh, you know, or, or false kind of perspectives that I have. Um, the, the, probably the, the one that I've written about that resonates with people the most in terms of mistakes is, um, has to do with persistence and quitting. So one of the things that we, uh, the research says pretty clearly is that the best entrepreneurs, the best, um, most successful people uh, are typically um, the ones that have the most grit uh, or persistence. And uh, this definitely, I've seen this to be true. It, it kind of has to be true. You know, I heard Elon Musk one, one time, somebody asked him like, you know, what would you say to aspiring entrepreneurs? And he was like, I wouldn't say anything. If you need encouragement from me, you shouldn't do it. It's too hard, you know? Uh, and, and there's some truth to that in that entrepreneurship is really challenging. And if you don't have grit, then it's not going to go well. But once you establish that, there's another truth that's unfortunate that, that needs to be addressed, which is the most persistent people 
can be the most blind to the need to quit in some situations because they they just get it in their mind that whatever I take up, I'm going to see it all the way through. And it's both the superpower and their Achilles heel. And so I wrote this entire blog post about like, when is persistence actually um, negative? When does it start to work against you? Uh, and when is quitting better? And so there was a, there was a business that my brother and I started um, a few years into us working together and we, we invested millions of dollars into it. And we kind of made every mistake in the book. And when we finally started to do beta testing, it was really obvious it wasn't there. It wasn't going to get there. But we probably stuck with it another year or year and a half and, and spent a lot of money on it. But looking back on it, the mistake was I just wasn't willing to let it go, you know, and uh, I, I wasn't willing to quit. So ironically, you know, I've made countless mistakes where like, oh, hey, I, I said this thing that was insensitive or, you know, I was I had hubris there and I, I, I you know, I, I didn't really understand the situation correctly or whatever. But some of the bigger mistakes I've made have been just continuing to pursue something just out of a desire to prove to myself that I could or that I could make it work instead of, you know, in, in the original Jurassic Park, there's this great line where one of the characters says, you were so concerned with whether or not you could that you didn't stop to think about whether or not you should. And, you know, that was an example of, of uh, that in my life that there, there have been times when I just kept put my head down and I kept pressing ahead because I felt like persistence was was the answer. And in reality, what I needed to do was stop and reassess and, and be willing uh, to pivot, be willing to quit. Wow, it's powerful. Um, yeah, I mean, just going back to your uh, point of, you know, dealing with mistakes is I feel like so many people have that image and they don't want to make mistakes and that almost cripples them and kind of puts them in that paralysis mode. So I think it's really cool how you embrace that. And that's how you kind of kept growing your company and kept going. And no matter what happened, you got grace and here you are today. It's amazing. Yeah, man. It's one of the things that the, the one of the ways that I word it is you're either more afraid of strikeouts or not hitting home runs and, and you can't be, and you have to choose. And there are some people that want to live their life that are like, I don't care if I ever hit a home run, but I, but I don't want to strike out. I am the type of person, and I certainly think it's a better way to live, where it's like, I'm more afraid of never taking a swing big enough to hit a home run than I am of, of having some strikeouts. And, and I would even make the observation that, you know, like there's a reason why Babe Ruth for a long time was the league leader in strikeouts and home runs. Like these two are linked together. Um, there's a lot of research about successful people that says what makes them successful is their willingness to get in the box and keep swinging the bat. And so, um, if you're afraid of failure, if you have a fragile self-image where any kind of negative feedback or any kind of failure will cause you to spiral, then you're going to shy away from situations that, that might not go well. The, the biggest problem, though, with fear of failure is it stunts your learning. That we really, I, I'm convinced that we learn through failing. And it, like one of the ways I've described it, I have two kids is that parenting is primarily about, at least in the early years, it's helping your kids fail in non-fatal ways. Like you want to teach your kids that water is dangerous when they can't swim, but you don't want them to drown. And so like, it's like you're, you're, you're playing this game where unless they experience water as a little bit scary, then they, they could be irresponsible and they could really hurt themselves. Um, or unless they understand that the hot stove, you know, will burn their hand and they shouldn't touch it. You don't want them to get a third degree on burn on their hand finding that out, but you want them to know that this is, unfortunately, you know, I wish we were more evolved than this or something, but we're not. This is how we learn. We learn by making mistakes. We learn by things not going well. Um, and so when the, there's, Carol Dweck has a book about growth mindset that talks a lot about this, but um, when we start becoming afraid of failure, we stop growing and we start avoiding any situation um, that could make us look bad and, and we stagnate. What motivates you to, I mean, what motivated you to kind of 
you know, be an entrepreneur and take the road less traveled by, you know, many people? So I don't know that I viewed myself as an entrepreneur until a few years ago. And it's funny because now I think there are a lot of people that kind of view me as the stereotypical entrepreneur, but I, I didn't view myself that way. Um, I think at this point, I think the reason why I love entrepreneurship is that I really do feel like I have vision. I feel like I have a desire to make a positive and redemptive impact on the world. And I have a vision about how to do that. And uh, when you're an entrepreneur that really has a vision of a way that you want to impact the world, um, there's probably not a better way to do it. You know, this is one of the things I tell entrepreneurship students all the time that like college students today deeply want to make a difference in the world. And I don't know that there's a better way to do it than starting a company. Um, and so I, I love that, you know, especially coming from a nonprofit background. Really, the reason I transitioned from a nonprofit background to the for-profit world is I felt like I, it wasn't that anything changed about my worldview. It was more I just felt like I could make more impact um, and have more scale of impact working in the business world. And I think that's what's, you know, continued to motivate me. There's days where I, I've told people that I, I feel like a little bit of a nonprofit refugee in the for-profit world where there's parts of the nonprofit that, you know, lifestyle and day-to-day and, -day and, and kind of focus that I actually enjoy more, but uh, I, I, there's, it just wouldn't be possible for me to make the same scale of impact. And so um, that's, that's been what's kept me here. It's amazing. Um, if you were talking to, um, you know, a college student looking to graduate and start their own business, or even a, you know, a 30 year old mother who wants to, you know, branch off and do her own thing. What are some piece of, what are some, you know, piece of advice you'd give to that person? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one thing I would say is that entrepreneurship is fundamentally about learning. And this is the reason why anybody can be an entrepreneur. You have to be curious. You have to want to learn. And if you're curious and you want to learn, then anybody can be a successful entrepreneur because as you learn about people, as you learn about a market, as you learn about a vertical, you will always see opportunities um, and ways that you can serve people and ways that you can solve problems. Um, so I, what I would tell most people is, number one, have a bias to action. Instead of just you know, dreaming about it, say, what can I tangibly do to take that first step? Um, what I have found is going from zero to one is exponentially harder than going from one to two. And anybody can go from 15 to 16. And so it's, it's helping push people, you know, if I, if it's a 30 year old mother who's saying, I, I wish I could be an entrepreneur, then it's like, how do you carve out 30 minutes a day or an hour a week to, um, to start learning, um, to, to start learning about a particular industry or to start learning about a, a particular skill or to get on Fiverr and do some, you know, freelance work or whatever, where you're starting the process of learning and growing and understanding. And then naturally over time, as you do that, you will, uh, it, it becomes more and more obvious what the next logical step is. The, the other thing that I'm really big on is uh, it's easier than ever to bootstrap something. It's easier than ever to have like a kind of a side hustle where you can learn and where you can grow it, but it, you don't have to kind of burn the ships and push all your chips in to do it. And I encourage people to do that. Um, people that are working, I really encourage them. If you can get a job, I would highly recommend getting a job at a faster growth startup kind of situation for two reasons. One, you're going to get exposed to a lot of different stuff and you're going to be able to watch you know, people who are really good operators up close, which is incredibly helpful. You know, we're very mimetic in how we learn and being able to watch people do things will, you know, there's a reason why there's like a PayPal mafia, for example. Um, but the second thing is in a, in a fast growing company, there's always a frontier. There's always new things that are kind of needing to be done and, and leadership that's needing to be asserted and, and new hires that need to be made. You get if you can just get your foot in the door at a fast growing company and you will grow with that company. And before you know it, you'll find yourself in a position of leadership. Um, you know, what I'll tell people is 
you know, if you have to get in the door as the janitor, it doesn't matter. If you just get in the door in a fast growing company, then you're, there are going to be opportunities that arise. Uh, Marissa Meyer famously, uh, she interviewed at Google when it was like 20 people and Larry Page offered her a job and her response was, you know, I, I really like the idea, but there's just not a lot of clarity around what my role will be. And what Larry Page said to her was, if somebody offers you a seat on a rocket ship, you take it. The role piece will take care of itself. And, and that's really what you find in faster growing smaller companies is as long as you get, get on board, there are going to be opportunities that bubble up that, that you, you don't uh, you don't anticipate. Um, and that, and, and so, you know, that accelerates your learning. So anything you can do to accelerate your learning and gain really practical skills, it becomes, it becomes a lot easier to understand, okay, how do I start to translate that into kind of a, a business? And for many people these days, it's that, you know, the business starts as a $5,000 revenue a year business. And then you look up and it's a $30,000 revenue a year business. And you look up a couple of years later and you could quit your job and do it full time. And, and that's a fantastic model as well, where you don't have to take on the same amount of risk. And so anyway, those are some of the, the pieces of advice I give. Mike, it's been an amazing interview. We're almost out of time here. I uh, just want to say I really appreciate your time on being on the show. Um, but last but not least, if people want to go learn more about you, how can they do so? Yeah, absolutely. Probably the two best places to follow me are on Twitter. Um, I'm at Mike Beckham SM um, and on LinkedIn. Um, and I, I post this kind of content. I try and post uh, just about daily this type of content. Cool. All right, Mike. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. All right. Thanks, Jason. Thank you for joining us on the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. We're here to help you create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want. We'll catch you next time on the Multifamily Millionaire. 